evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for being here. For those that don't know, my name is Stuart Schlossman, and I, too, have multiple sclerosis. Tonight, we want to thank, for doing tonight's program, we want to thank Celgene, a pharmaceutical company, and also Sanofi Genzyme. And I hope that you all can show your support for what they're giving their support. And let's give them a round of applause, please. Tonight's program, as I started to say, we have two speakers. We have Dr. Deletz who's a neuropsychologist, and we have Dr. Gold. Does everybody recognize those names? At least Dr. Gold, do you recognize it? Great. So, beginning tonight, I want to introduce Dr. Deletz. She's a licensed psychologist specializing in clinical neuropsychology. Dr. Deletz earned her doctorate of psychology from Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale with a specific focus of study on the effects of neurodegenerative disorders and brain injury on cognitive functioning and emotional well-being. Dr. Deletz completed a pre-doctoral internship at the Neurologic Institute at North Broward Medical Center and a two-year post-doctoral residency in a group neurology practice in Boca Raton. Dr. Deletz currently conducts neuropsychological evaluations for a variety of adult populations, including individuals and demyelinating disorders to determine the degree of deficits potential exacerbating factors, and to make recommendations regarding emotional and physical well-being for the future. Let's welcome Dr. Deletz. I hope I have your name right. Okay, good. All right. That's your... Hello. Thank you for having me, and thank you, everybody, for coming out in this rainy evening. I'm Dr. Delet, as he said. Um, Tonight I'd like to speak to you about the psychological factors of living with MS. And when we talk about the psychological factors of living with MS, it's, they're kind of blended, right? We have the physiological aspects of MS, um, and then we have the, the psychological or emotional aspects, and they kind of go hand in hand. There's not exactly a big, um, you know, when we talk about everybody has emotional feelings, and then you have the MS, and what comes first, the psychological issues? or the MS issues, what's causing what. We're gonna get into some, and get to some information about that. But our objectives for this evening are basically to, to talk about the emotional impacts on the individual with MS and the family unit, because it does affect everybody within the person with MS life, uh, lifestyle. It's not just a solitary um, disease. And discussing, the ma discussing managing the daily life challenges and what you have to go through daily on, for emo emotionally all these demands and how it affects you emotionally. And then address the change and what it means to you. And I underline you because you are in charge of your change as much as your team has to work with you, you have a medical team, you have support, but you have to follow through and be in charge and be an advocate for your care and your well-being. So as far as the emotional aspects of MS, you get the initial diagnosis, and a lot of people liken that to the grief reaction, like a denial, shock, I, that can't be. Um, I need a second opinion, or I'm not gonna go back to the doctor, I, that's, that can't be, we're just gonna wait and see. I slept on my arm funny, it's no big deal. So that kind of worries some people because you wanna be able to go back to the doctor and communicate and face what might be going on to get adequate treatment going forward. The, um, as far as the other reactions with initial response, grief response, the anger, why me, why is this happening? You get angry at the disease, the doctor some kind, sometimes takes the brunt, they don't know what they're talking about, this can't be, again, with the denial. And then what if you found out sooner, the bar, that's kind of the bargaining part of the denial, what if, we found, what if I found out sooner? Why did I wait to go to the doctors? What if I ate differently? What if I, what if, what if, what if, what if, and you're blaming yourself and beating yourself up over what you could not have controlled. As far as depression is concerned, about over 50% is what they're estimating of people with MS have depression. Unfortunately, this is very underreported, undertreated, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as to why. But they, there's, it's different from being sad. You can be sad at, at the diagnosis and grieve the losses that you're enduring. But depression is a whole nother level, and we kind of need to differentiate between those because one can be treated, depression can be treated. Grief kind of fluctuates, comes and goes. Depression, 
you kind of stick with it for, it sticks with you for a while and it can affect the other parts of your functioning, including cognitive, which I will talk about that too, that's my specialty. Um, and acceptance, you go through acceptance, okay, so now what? This is, I gotta deal with it, I'm gonna have to adapt, now what can I do? Can I still do and what can I not do? And for those things that I can't do, can I modify them to still do them and can I get through um, some of the obstacles that they're presenting to me? And for some people with MS, and this is not necessarily related to the grief reaction, I hope, but relief. Wow, I finally know what's happening. I'm not crazy, it's not all in my head the way people are, are kind of and staying that it is in that negative way. It is in my head, it's called MS. It affects my, my central nervous system, which includes my brain, my spinal cord. Yes, but it's, you're not crazy, you're not a hypochondriac, you're not running to the doctor for every little tiny tingle that you have and there's nothing wrong with you and nobody can diagnose it and they're telling you you're fine. You finally have a diagnosis, a name to it, and a plan going forward with the right treatment team. So longer term reactions, these are gonna fluctuate with the disease. Anxiety, okay, when's the next flare-up coming? It's a, a very unpredictable. When's the next flare-up coming? When am I gonna, how am I gonna handle all the roles that I have in front of me? Am I gonna be able to handle those roles? This may create kind of a bit of an excitement. I'm getting anxious by now just thinking about it. Um, <laughs> anger, irritability, not knowing how to handle it or what to do with that anger and irritability because you, you kind of get the mood swings and a little bit of mood fluctuations with MS. Um, having to learn how to cope with that and how to deal with it without it spilling over onto friends, family, coworkers, et cetera, and kind of exacerbating all the other problems that might be happening in those areas. You have the physical problems that are limiting you, now you got this emotional reaction, kind of need to rein those in a little bit and we'll talk about maybe some strategies to do that. Um, fear, fear of what if I go out with my friends and I can't um, make it to the bathroom in time? What if I go to the park with my children and I can't make it for more than 15 minutes, I gotta take them home, I'm gonna disappoint them. I might as well not even go. So fear leads to depression, social, isolation, uh, social withdrawal, isolation, you kinda just stop doing things because you're afraid of what might happen when you do them. So you kinda bring yourself in, you pull yourself in, you get isolated, and that leads to more depression. It's a vicious little spiral that can happen. Um, with depression, we're gonna talk about difference between depression and grief a little bit later, but it's more than just feeling sad. It's like I said, it takes you, it, it kind of takes over. I, can, I liken it to like a wet blanket over you. And your brain is so busy trying to deal with everything that's going on, and then depression comes over like a wet blanket and just makes it even worse. So everything gets harder and you're more exhausted trying to do things and move forward and get your life, get whatever you need to done, do that day done. So you're finding yourself doing the bare minimum, just what I have to do to get by. And that can be a, a symptom of depression. Or you just don't do anything at all and that's even worse. So we're gonna talk about that as well. So apathy, I just don't care. I don't care anymore. I can't do it, not gonna do it, not even gonna try. This is my life, it's over as I know it. I don't care. We see that sometimes initially and throughout the fluctuations of the disease. It's kind of a, not a linear state here, it fluctuates. You go back and forth, back and forth. Suicide risk. People with MS are at higher risk for suicide. They've got physiological issues, now they've got the emotional issues, they all kind of feed on each other why am I here? What am I even doing here? But even more important to talk about is not necessarily you have a plan that you're going to hurt yourself. You have some thought and idea and you intend and if this happens or that happens, I'm gonna go out and hurt myself. It's a state of mind in that I don't wanna be here anymore. I don't wanna live like this. Or I ask my patients questions such as, do you ever feel like you just wanna to go to sleep and not wake up? And I'll ask if they've ever thought of hurting themselves, that they'd say, no, no, no. But have you ever thought of ever going to sleep and not waking up? Oh yes, all the time. That's a state of feeling that is not easy to live with. And that is definitely a sign of the emotional side effects of MS, the depression, the apathy. 
the loss of self-worth. So as far as depression is concerned, so what docs are going to look at, or a lot of docs will look at, is were you depressed before you were diagnosed with MS? I mean, talking lifelong depression. I talk to people and they say, oh, I've depressed all my life. Was it a symptom of MS that you didn't recognize? Or was it something that's in your personality or in your previous life where you were depressed before? Now you have this, this diagnosis and it makes it worse? Or is this something that you're reacting to as far as the MS is concerned? MS, depending upon where it is in the brain, and of course your physiological and your emotional emotional reactions that go hand in hand can affect your mental state. So you, it can cause depression or exacerbate your depressive state. And um, medication effects. Some medications, check your labels, I'm not a medical doctor so I can't speak to this too well, but some medications have a warning label on them about depression. So if you see that and you're feeling depressed since you've been on that medication or your depression is worsening, speak to your medical provider about that. Mm -hmm. See what they can do, if they can change anything about the medication that you're on or if they can add something to help you with that depression. So as far as uh, symptoms of MS versus depression, it's very difficult sometimes to, do, to diagnose depression in individuals with MS because a lot of their symptoms overlap and people are so focused on the physiological aspects of MS that they don't pay attention to the emotional, as that, that the emotional part may be something that's going on in addition to the MS. It's not, it doesn't have to always be a symptom of MS. It could be a reaction to the symptoms of MS as well, a combination of the two. So these are the depressive symptoms and the DSM-4 is what we use as psychologists to diagnose things. If you have clinical depression, we go through these criteria. These are the symptoms of depression that overlap with MS. Fatigue, loss of energy, check. Difficulty concentrating or making decisions, check. Psychomotor agitation, kind of feeling restless or slowing, just sluggish all the time. Feelings of worthlessness or guilt come along with our role, the different uh, aspects that MS has, different effects MS has on our role, roles in life. These are the other symptoms of depression, and they too can overlap with MS. These are the main ones. Irritability or tearfulness. Loss of interest or pleasure in most activities. Weight loss or weight gain without trying. Weight loss without trying, weight gain without trying. In other words, you're not dieting or exercising, you're just losing or gaining weight. Too much or too little sleep, and recurrent thoughts of death or suicide. Now you need one of those first two, irritability or cheerfulness or loss of interest or pleasure in most, most activities, which we call anhedonia, to be diagnosed with clinical depression. But do you have to be diagnosed clinically? Do you have to have every single symptom? and? you know, to be diagnosed, to have a depressive disorder? No. You can have depression without having to have all of these things. You can have a few of them and still be considered clinically depressed if it's affecting your everyday functioning. So it's hard to differentiate again, is MS affecting my everyday functioning or is the depression doing it or is it a combination of the two? What's making what worse? I'm going to go back to this. So one of the ways that you can determine what's making what worse. Depression, what's making me feel this way? Is it the depression or is it the MS or a combination of the two? Is by testing. Now some of your doctors will give you brief screening measures for um, depressive symptoms and that will kind of give us an idea as to what you're feeling and how you're perceiving your, your feelings and your thoughts. And we can use that. And then there's other ways to, and I'm not toting my, I'm not touting my, um, my practice here because you'd have to wait a few months. Anyway, but there's neuropsychologists who can do, whether in this area or other areas, who can do some testing. And Dr. Gold and I have developed a battery of tests specifically for his MS patients. And I'm the only one who does it for him. But, um, because we have a couple neuropsychologists in our office. That is a shorter battery. Most of the neuropsychological testing is four to six hours long. This is a one to two hour long battery. It includes an interview with me and one to two hours, of about one and a half hours of testing that looks at the meat and potatoes of MS. It looks at attention, concentration, focus, processing speed, how that affects memory, language, et cetera, psychological aspects, 
to see if there's a really high rate of psychological function or psychological symptoms and how that might be affecting the cognitive symptoms and vice versa. If your cognition is fine and your depression is way up here, we know what's going on. There's some, some depression affecting your everyday functioning. When you're able to sit down and do these tests and do them well, that tells us that you're able to do the cognitive things that you need to. It's the depression that's kind of putting that wet blanket on your, on your, on your brain and keeping it from being able to put forth that energy going forward. So living with MS for loved ones of individuals with MS, it impacts, impacts the whole family. And you, gotta, you have to acknowledge that. I mean, there's the fear of what's going to happen next. And they experience some of the same symptoms you do. The fear of what's going to happen next. What does this mean for us? What does this mean for your role as a family member? Um, with children, even teenagers, you know, is mom or dad going to, are they going to, they don't understand. Are they going to die? Are they going to be able to take care of me? How is this going to affect their ability to take care of me? Children are very egocentric, meaning that smaller children in particular, grandchildren even, meaning that they feel that everything revolves around them. We've all seen this. But the, what you want to do is make sure that they don't feel it's their fault. So communicating with your loved one, your family members, the children, keeping them informed as to what's been going on or what is going on and what to expect going forward, even though a lot of it you can't predict, but what might happen gives them a sense of control and power and involvement that they can take charge and help you take charge of some of the things that maybe you can't do any longer. So I liken it to getting a, um, make MS the, the bad guy, not the person who has it. So I've got this, I've got this, I call them bad germs to my little kids when I try to get them to brush their teeth. I've got these bad germs inside of me. They're not doing well for me. They make me tired sometimes. They make me not feel so good. So if mommy doesn't want, mommy or daddy doesn't want to go to the park, or grandma or grandpa doesn't want to go to the park, or can't make it to your games, please don't think it's because we don't want to be there. It's because the bad germs have taken over the day, and it's not a good day for mommy or daddy to expend the energy for those things. I'm going to reserve that energy for another time that we can spend together and enjoy ourselves. Fair? Okay. So as far as the guilt with family members, why didn't I send them to the doctor sooner? How did I not know this was happening? People can experience that as well. And you have to reassure them that there's, there's nothing that anybody could do or could have done to make this happen or not happen. Um, anger, why is this happening? If they took better care of themselves or they just did X, Y, Z, this wouldn't have happened. Not true. It's, it's, there's no known con, um, consistent etiology here. We just know that it's happened, and there's some, some theories out there as to why it may happen in some than others, but it's not something that you or your family members could control. Denial, that can't be. You look perfectly fine. What's, that's crazy. It's all in your head. Again, um, family members may not be able to see what Stuart has already, already referred to as the invisible signs of MS. So how many times have you parked in a handicapped spot because you, it takes you a little longer or, it, or you get very fatigued walking to the grocery store and you get the dirty looks from people when you walk out and you walk fine. And <clears throat> Did anybody see the thing on Facebook where the girl's poor lady's car was vandalized because she parked in a spot? Her handicap stick placard was there. And she came out from the store, young, pretty girl, probably in her 30s, 40s maybe, and they vandalized her car because she parked in a handicapped spot, not knowing that she had MS. So how hard is that to take? So people can't see your symptoms. You look fine, you act fine, you talk fine, everything is great. So sometimes those symptoms are invisible to your family members as well, and they may not understand. So it's very important that you educate them on what MS does to the brain, to the body, to the emotions so that they can help under, help you with dealing with it and also help themselves with accepting it and going forward. And everybody, everybody deals with stress differently. So um, some people might want to be quiet and not talk about it. Some people may want to talk about it, know everything about it, but just kind of respect each other's ways of coping 
Everybody copes with things very differently. Eventually, there has to be communication, however that can be, but don't force it. And see when people are ready to talk about it and learn more. Open up, talk about it, learn more about it, let them Google it on their own, whatever it takes for them to kind of take, get a grasp of what's happening. But the more, most important thing is that their feelings are acknowledged and respected, and their reactions are acknowledged, and everybody's feelings are heard. You want to make sure that everybody has a say and a, a, an input in what's going on going forward. Um, but how to discuss, again, with the children, tell them what's happening. Children are very observant. They know when something's wrong. And like I said, that egocentricity makes them think it's all about them. I must have done something to make mom or dad wrong, uh, mad at me. Or um, it's all my fault. If I just did X, Y, Z, this wouldn't have happened. If they see marital stress because of the MS, oh my gosh, if I just didn't color on the wall or whatever, it failed that test, maybe mom and dad wouldn't be fighting right now. It's not about them. It's about what you're going through. So make sure they're aware of what's happening and educate them to the best of your ability for, that, for their emotional maturity level. And there are wonderful resources on the MS websites for educating children and teens. Again, make it um, direct frustrations. It helps them direct their frustrations at the disease itself, not at the person. Because um, sometimes kids want to get mad at you. Why are you sick? Why are you doing this to me? And that's not the case. You'll have to explain that to them. And discuss how the family can work together to adjust to life changes. Um, make it a team effort. It gives children a sense of purpose and a sense of control. So if you can tell them, Mom or dad may not be able to do X, Y, Z in the house, around the house anymore, but if you can help me, maybe together we can all benefit from coming together and making this a little bit easier for everybody in the household so that it, everything is not piled on to the person with MS. If you're a stay-at-home mom and you have to do everything, that's not going to be, that's not going to happen. Um, it's going to be good days and bad days. Some days you may be able to, some days you may not, but for your kids to understand that this is a good day, this is a not so good day, they need to know how to deal with that going forward. All right, so daily life challenges and demands. How do you handle them emotionally? This poor girl was on Facebook all over the place with her car thing, and she had a great attitude. She said, you know what, they don't know. They're not educated in it, and they just don't know. These symptoms are invisible to them. They don't see them. I don't have a broken leg. I'm not using a walker. I'm not in a wheelchair. They see a perfectly healthy, young, pretty girl walking into a store using grandma's tag. It's not the case. So she took it, with, she took it in stride. It was very painful for her to have that done to her car, but she was like, OK, I'm going to understand that people don't understand what I'm going through. It's up to you whether or not you want to educate others about what you're going through. It's the people who are closest to you that you probably want to educate. Anybody else? You're going to have to just let it go. If it, and if it's going to stress you, let it go. Do they matter in your lives? Are they worth it? If not, let it go. Are you ever going to see these people again? Hopefully not. Let it go. <laughs> so, but as far as your, your, um, your family, that they definitely need to be involved. Now, there's negative and positive stress. Negative stress is what everybody thinks of when you think, oh, I'm stressed. That's work stress, family stress, financial stress, all the everyday things that occur as a, in your life, everybody has stressors, right? And there's the good stress, positive stress. Planning a wedding, planning a baby shower, having a new grandchild. These are all wonderful, happy things, but there is stress involved because you're, you have to plan, you have to do things. How am I going to get to X, you know, from A to B? Um, am I going to have, I got to plan this wedding for six months out. I don't know how I'm going to be feeling on that particular day or in that time period. How do we plan for things? and go forward and enjoy our lives when we have no, there's no, we have such an unpredictable disease. So good, even positive things in your life can cause stress. Acute versus chronic. So acute traumatic event. Researchers say even an acute traumatic event may actually have no effect on the course of MS, long-term course of MS, and may actually be protective. I don't know why, but they said it's going to be. It might be like protective, like it's like a, almost like a um, a wake up call, like doom. This has happened. I've got to pick up my stuff and go on. Okay, so maybe that's what they were talking about. But chronic stress, which is everyday stress, 
you aren't able to do your job any longer because of your symptoms. You um, financially have to quit your job, so financially there's stressors. You aren't able to give as much attention to your children, your husband, your family members, your friends. This is chronic stress, marital distress that was there even before MS became or became worse or started after MS created some um, role switches within the family. So we're going to talk about how to handle some of these. So how do you handle these? There's going to be good days and not so good days. So again, communication with your family and the people who you have to perform these roles for is key. So what level of assistance is needed for good days and not so good days? On good days, are you able to drive yourself to work? Are you able to take your kids to school, drive yourself to the grocery store, pick out your own groceries, get them in the cart, take them home, lift them, take them in the house? Is that, if that's a good day, okay, you have plan A, there's your good day. What happens on a bad day? Not so good day. Um, do you have a backup plan? Is there somebody who can do that for you if it's something that you do on a daily basis? Pick up your grandchildren or your children from school. Where's the backup plan for that? You need to have it in place in case you're having a bad day. Otherwise, you're gonna, first of all, not gonna be able to pick up whatever you need to do or go to work or what have you. You're gonna not be able to fulfill your role but you're all, it's also going to make you not feel so good about yourself calling people and saying, hey, this is a bad day, I can't do it. But if you've informed them ahead of time, communicate your plans, your spouse, your children, your employer, other people who are important to you, other people you interact with on a daily basis who have needs that you meet. If you can communicate with them ahead of time and say, hey, this is what's going on. This is what happens on a bad day, on a not so good day. And these are my plans to have a, a backup just in case plan for those days. Is that okay with you? Is that acceptable for you? And on your good days, you don't have to worry about it, but you can tell them, I can't predict when these good or bad days are going to happen. So you may get a phone call in the morning saying, I can't come in today, but understand that it's because of the disease state and I will do my best to resume my duties as soon as these not so good days um, subside. And a lot of people have had to go on disability because they can no longer do what they used to do at work. And that's perfectly understandable. But there are still other people in your world that need you or expect you to do things or are counting on you for something. So let's make sure you have a plan in place to accommodate their needs and not make you feel like you're letting people down. That's another thing with the guilt. Prioritize your time and energy. What activities and things can be put aside for another day? Um, you have a list of, or make some goals, okay. You can make goals for the day, you can make goals for the year. You can make goals for your lifetime. But if you have things that you wanna do for the day, I gotta clean, I gotta clean the house, I gotta do the dishes, do the laundry, da da da, pick up the kids, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. You have all these things that you need to do. Put aside the ones that aren't gonna kill anybody if you don't do them. The dishes can sit. It's okay, I know it's gross, but they're not gonna go anywhere. They'll be waiting for you when you feel better. Or if your spouse or your children can help out, they can, they can handle those things. Um, spend the time with your family. Don't worry about how clean the house is or that the dishes are dirty or that the laundry isn't done. Just make sure you have clean clothes for the next day. But just spend some time with your family and your loved ones. Life is too short. It's, it, and the kids, especially grandchildren, children, teenagers, even your grown children still need mommy and daddy. So spend that time with them, talk to them, communicate with them, enjoy their presence. Don't beat yourself up because you're not able to do all the things that you used to do for them around the house or drive them everywhere or attend every single event. You're going to be there quality. The, the time with them is going to be a quality versus quantity issue. You want to spend quality time with your loved ones. But conserve that energy. Don't spend it on things that you don't need, that don't need you emotionally. The dishes don't care. <laughs> they will not be offended if you don't do them. All right. So change and what it means to you. I promise I'm not texting while I'm doing this. I'm just, no, that didn't work. 
um, change and what it means to you. So, in order to set about for change, you gotta take a step back. Allow yourself, if you haven't already, to grieve the things that you have lost with this disease. You've lost some, if you've lost some physical functioning, if you've lost some independence, if you've lost some control over emotions or physiological functions, allow yourself to say, this is horrible, I don't like this, this is not good, I really wish I could be back to where I was. But, and kind of let yourself grieve that, that for a while. You aren't gonna be the same person, you can be close, but you can, you're gonna have to, I, hate, I keep saying you're gonna have to. You should let yourself adapt and grieve to it. To it, and with grief versus depression, grief you 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 grieve the loss of something, and then you kind of adapt to it. And unfortunately, with MS, you grieve the loss of something, you kind of adapt to it, and then something else comes along, and now you start back over again. Oh my gosh, now I can't do this, and you grieve the loss of that, and you adapt to it, and then something else comes along. You go, holy moly, now I can't see out of my left eye if I get too hot. Okay, um, let's see how we can adapt to that. And we make some changes in our lifestyles and on our, our regimen that tells us what exactly we need, you know, have you, tips and pointers of what you need to do to avoid these things from, keep these things from happening. Now as far as, yeah. So stamina and abilities in some areas have changed. But acknowledge what you're still able to do, even if you need to modify it a little bit. If you enjoy a physical activity, but you can't exactly do that particular physical activity, if you used to run or go to the gym or what have you, you're not able to do that any longer, see if you can modify it a little bit. See if you can go for a walk or see if you can use a treadmill on low speed and make sure you know how to use it before you get on it. We don't want to see you on those funny bloopers with people flying off the treadmill. But the treadmills have the, have the handles. You can kind of take yourself at your own pace and walk and do the exercise. Try not to anticipate losses and give up on activities because you don't think you're gonna be able to do them or not do them as well as before. I used to be a great tennis player. I can't play tennis anymore, that's it. Okay, well, you might still be able to go out there and hit the ball a little bit. You're not gonna be running around like one of the pros, but you might still be able to go out there and enjoy yourself a bit. Don't give up completely because you don't think you can. Try, try a little bit, push yourself to the, whatever limit is safely available to you and see what you can do. Um, don't just say, oh, you know, I might, I might trip, I might fall, I might do this. If you're tripping and falling all the time, yeah, don't do that, don't do tennis. But if you haven't gotten to that point and you have a little numbness in your finger or you're not dizzy all the, if you move too quickly, Go out there, see if you can just kind of, you know, hit the ball against the wall or something. Don't play with anybody else. Just hit the ball against the wall. Release some stress. But um, don't give up on everything for fear of not being able to do it. And you also might find new things that you like to do. So brainstorm with some other people who have MS or who have other uh, issues that prevent them from doing some of the physical things that you, use, you like to do. And um, see if they have any ideas. Maybe you'll find something new and exciting that you explore and you fall in love with. All right. So taking control of your well-being. In order to make change, it has to start with you. Your family can help. They can do all the things that you want them to do. They can do the dishes, they can do the laundry, they can help you go grocery shopping, they can buy the groceries, bring them home, they can cook, they can do all these things for you. But you have to be a part of that and help with whatever you can. If it's not physically, emotionally, be there for your family. But also you need to advocate for your care. Speak up, make sure your concerns are heard and needs are met. And that's with your family and with your health care providers, especially for your mental health. So depression is typically not reported or anxiety or emotional feelings are not reported to the doctors because they, a lot of people think this is just part of the MS, this is how I'm going to feel. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. And like I said, we can do testing or they can evaluate, your doctors can evaluate whether or not this is a symptom of or a reaction to the MS. Reaction to the MS, 
we can address with psychotherapy, medications if needed. There's something that can be done to fix, to make you feel better, which is everybody's goal. Your doctors want you to feel better. They want you to be able to do what you can do at, to the best of your ability. And that's what you want too, hopefully. Um, so the healthy emotional state can make a world of difference for change. If you're depressed and you don't feel like doing anything, you're not going to change. Nothing's going to change. You're going to kind of stay static. Things might even get worse. But you need to start working on that attitude. And if it takes a, a counselor or a medication to do that, seek the help. It's, there's no shame in that. I mean, everybody would expect you to have an emotional reaction to your diagnosis. If you didn't, I'd wonder what was wrong with you. So you're going to have that emotional reaction to the diagnosis. You're going to not be happy with it. But there needs to be a time where you say, OK, I'm going to cut my losses here and move, pick up with what I have and move forward. Um, exercise and healthy eating. So there's a lot of things you cannot control with MS. You just, there's unpredictability, lack of control. Those are very hard symptoms to deal with. But there are things that you can control that may help. So healthy eating and exercise, things you can control with some of the symptoms. It helps with um, uh, depression, it helps with your mood, and it gives you something to do other than focusing on the negatives. You can focus on the positive things that you can do to help and, and go forward with MS. Recreation, maintain your positive relationships. Um, plan for some fun time with the people you enjoy, your family, your friends. Uh, you never know who you might be inspiring. Um, here you are with this diagnosis, with some limitations that some people can't even see, but you are out there, you are doing it. You're here tonight getting educated and gaining more information. I applaud you for that, trying to make your lives better and learning more about how to deal with MS and um, emotional health going forward. All right. Well, that's it for me. Um, <laughs> thank you for having me. So, that was loud. Next, even though you know Dr. Gold, I have to read this anyway. I made him put this together and he was like, wow, I've never done this before. <laughs> All right. So, firstly, we we'll want to thank Dr. Deletta again for speaking. And of course, next, I want to introduce you to Dr. DeGold. Dr. DeGold, listen to me. <laughs> Dr. Gold. <laughs> uh, Dr. Gold. He's a neurologist with special interest in multiple sclerosis. He has been awarded several times by the National MS Society for Mission Awards, Central Florida Chapter, 1998, Above and Beyond Award, and with the Central Florida Chapter again in 1997. Dr. Gold is a physician in the Health, Health First Medical Group, a multi-specialty medical group in Melbourne, Florida. He has been practicing in Brevard County since 1983. That's it. That's all you gave me. Oh my gosh, I didn't get second page. I only got one page. Go ahead, now you could tell us. Okay. Dr. Gold has a very large family, and he has lots of grand grandchildren too. So we do want to welcome him for being here today, and thank you for joining us. I'm not going to be one of those people that says, let me tell you about my grandchildren. However, I do have three boys and three grandchildren, all from two, uh, two of the boys. So. All right, so we won't get into that in a lot of detail, so I don't bore you. Okay, so the, the lecture has the potential for being fairly long, so I'm going to try to hit the high points, and uh, we can save most of the um, talk for the question and answer session at the end. I hope to give you kind of an overview. Um, Stuart always likes to give me a series, a laundry list of things he likes to talk about, likes me to talk about, and most of the time I can hit most of them, and I'll try to do so tonight. But uh, we'll try to make it interesting and informative and uh, leave plenty of time for Q&A. If you have any burning questions and something's not clear, 
from my talk, you can stop me, but uh, hope, try to hold it until the end. <clears throat> I'm going to figure this out. Here we go. So these are just some of the disclosures. These are the companies that I've spoken for uh, and that I've done research for. Okay, so this is the agenda. We're going to talk about MS in general. We'll talk about some of the facts that are known. Uh, we'll talk about some of the approaches to MS, uh, particularly concentrating on uh, things like pain. Uh, we'll also talk about a little bit about uh, exacerbations, and we'll um, touch a little bit on disease-modifying therapies, but we don't have enough time to get into a lot of the detail for that. <clears throat> um, and now we're also going to talk about what your role and responsibility would be in comprehensive health care. So we're going to try to bring everything together. We talked a little bit about the psychological aspects. We're going to talk about the physical aspects. Uh, but it really is um, separated only by uh, the talk. When you're talking about the brain, it's really a cohesive uh, type of um, part of the brain. And so we want to make sure that um, when we're approaching MS and the management, uh, that we do it in a cohesive way, in a comprehensive way. <clears throat> okay, so what is MS? Well, um, let's talk a little bit about the history, and th this is pretty tedious, but I'll try to hit a few of the high points. Uh, so the earliest description of MS was a woman from Holland, a skater who uh, in 1395 uh, had features that were uh, strongly suggestive of MS, and that was described in the literature. The first autopsies were in 1838, and it wasn't until 1868 that Dr. Charcot from the University of Paris actually described uh, the first clinical features of MS and correlated that with uh, the pathologic features. And then as time went on, we, uh, in the 1900s, uh, Dr. Dawson, uh, through pathology, was able to demonstrate the Dawson fingers that we can see on the MRI. And those are the little finger-like projections that uh, project out from the ventricular system or ventricular surface. Uh, we also started to gain more and more information about the immune systems and how it played a role. Uh, by 1937, we started to uh, gain some information about what MRI could do for us. And by 1965, I mean, by the 1970s, we actually uh, developed MRIs that could be used uh, for various uh, uh, disorders of the brain and the body. Uh, in 1965, we had some of the early clin clinical criteria, and then we started to move into um, both clinical and MRI criteria into the 1980s, 90s, and beyond. And, uh, by 2001 through 2010, we developed the uh, McDonald criteria, and even after uh, Ian McDonald's death, uh, they carried on and were able to come up with a revised set of uh, criteria by about uh, 2018, the beginning of uh, last year. So it's been an interesting journey. We've learned quite a bit, and we still have quite a bit to go, but we're making progress. Okay, what is MS? Well, we know MS is a disorder or group disorders that affect the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, we know that it's an autoimmune process, which means that for some reason our immune system is generating inflammation. It's attacking nerves, attacking the myelin, and it's producing the symptoms that we now know as MS. And it's extremely variable, as you know, uh, from person to person. It's become a very, uh, it's been a complex journey trying to figure out uh, how this is all putting together. Uh, we know that the, when there's attack on the myelin sheath, it slows down the nerves and that produces the symptoms. We also know now that there's attack on the nerves themselves directly and that produces a degeneration that can occur over many decades. Uh, we used to think that there's, uh, there was direct correlation. There is some correlation between the amount of demyelination and the amount of nerve degeneration, but nerve degeneration is now also known to occur independently of the demyelination and so people may degenerate from day one and not appreciate it uh, until many decades later. Uh, so it's that ax axon injury, that filament that seems to play a role as well. And some people were um, debating whether this could be uh, primarily an axonal disease or a demyelinating disease. We still, still haven't sorted that out, uh, but we know that um, both processes occur simultaneously and play a role. There's also an interesting uh, theory between uh, with the immune system, is this an inside-out disease? In other words, is it something that originates in the brain and then generates uh, the immune response outside the nervous system? Or is this being generated by 
the um, cells outside the nervous system that then go in and attack the nerve secondarily. And there's a lot of debate. There's probably components of both. There's probably an abnormal immune system combined with triggers in the nervous system that are generating uh, that uh, attraction for those nerves to, for those cells to come into the nervous system and cause damage. <clears throat> Autoimmune diseases are prevalent. Uh, we used to think that um, uh, we, we really didn't know that so many diseases could be tied together by an abnormal immune system, and we now know that's uh, quite possible. Uh, so we share, the different diseases share some genes in terms of the immune response, but they all has, also have unique genes that are um, unique to the individual organ system. So you can see different nerves. You may not be able to see it very well in the back, uh, but going down the list, the uh, joints can be affected in the immune process through rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis. Uh, the muscles can be affected through things like polymyositis, polymyalgia rheumatica, the nerve muscle junction and myasthenia. Uh, you get into systemic processes like uh, psoriasis for the skin, uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis for the thyroid gland, uh, Crohn's disease and um, ulcerative colitis, autoimmune hepatitis. All these things are known uh, to have autoimmune processes within the different organs and by um, the immune system attacking these organs, that's what produces the disease and the symptoms. And we've learned from each other's and the different disciplines have shared information about uh, immune suppression, trying to uh, dampen down the immune system uh, so that you could treat the disease and uh, still be able to lead uh, improved lives. And you can see that uh, we've had a tremendous breakthrough in the different uh, immune suppressants. We've been able to control a lot of these diseases. Many of these diseases would uh, uh, cause death very early. The reason they call it myasthenia gravis is because it was a very grave disease. It was a very uh, life-threatening disease. People didn't live very long from it, and we found out how to control it, how to um, support people on ventilators uh, in the various uh, things like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. We've been able to control those diseases now, and you see a lot of these um, uh, medications on the commercials, their monoclonal antibodies are used to treat these various disorders and are able to uh, help people leave uh, relatively normal lives now. <clears throat> so there are certain risk factors we know for developing MS. There's the genes that play a role. There are certain viruses, uh, germs in the environment. We think the climate, sun exposure, vitamin D exposure uh, plays an important role. Uh, it also is very different from different populations, so we know it tends to be a higher risk in uh, northern European uh, backgrounds. Uh, we know that um, uh, the numbers vary, but you can see in the northern United States and uh, Canada are higher incidence uh, because either because of the uh, environment, living in the north and being away from uh, the sun, or is it more because of migration patterns coming over from Northern European? And it may be a mixed uh, pattern. We know that Africans and African Americans and Southeast Asians uh, do not have the disease as often, but when they do, they tend to have a more aggressive form of the disease. Other risk factors are things just having one autoimmune disease predisposes people usually to have other autoimmune diseases as well. Sometimes it runs in the family, sometimes not. Uh, the viral exposure um, seems to be important, such as the herpes viruses, the Epstein-Barr virus, and so forth, seem to be related, but they're not the sole cause. And then people have tried to identify a virus, a single virus for many decades that would cause the disease, and we've never been able to isolate one particular virus. It's always a series of viruses that may in a given person cause or trigger some of the symptoms and trigger the immune response. Uh, we have vitamin D levels that are important, obesity, especially in teenagers, excessive salt intake, smoking. All these can uh, lead to either uh, a higher risk of the disease or higher progression of the disease to uh, progressive forms. Uh, excessive alcohol intake can do that through uh, poor nutrition, through direct damage on the nerves in the central nervous system as well as the peripheral nervous system and, and the peripheral nerves. Lack of exercise, uh, diet plays a role, and uh, bowel, organism, bowel organisms are becoming a, a bigger topic now, and the flora within the gut seems to play a role. Uh, we're still trying to understand more about you know, just how important that is. It plays a role, but we don't know the uh, degree. 
So we know there's been debates about whether things like mad cow or swine flu could be uh, something, and it's taken us a long time, but we finally figured out exactly what kind of virus and transmission it is to humans, and it's through this kind of transmission that uh, it's pretty obvious. Okay. I, I wish I had been the one to take that picture. Um, but I'm glad it's not my child, so. <laughs> okay, so the um, immune system will attack the nerves. What you're seeing here is within the central nervous system, you have the filament or the axon surrounded by these fatty sheaths called the myelin sheath. And they're connecting uh, to oligodendrocytes, which are the cells that actually uh, form the myelin around those nerves. And so the myelin in there is to help conduction, help speed conduction, it protects the nerves, it nourishes the nerves. So they're very important for uh, nervous system function. And when you get activation of uh, the T cells, T cells are a type of lymphocyte or white blood cell, when they get activated by the process, and again, we don't know what is the initiating event, but when they become activated, they start to form uh, and release cytokines, which can cause damage to the nerves and the oligodendrocytes. Okay, and that's what causes the damage. If there's enough damage to the myelin, uh, the nerves don't get the proper nutrition. Uh, they start to um, actually sever and die off. And you can see in the next film that um, if that process occurs for too long, you start to actually get transection, which is a, a severing of the nerve and separation from. Um, the rest of the uh, nervous system and those cells uh, never regenerate. So the idea is to try to catch things in the earlier demyelinating phases and not wait until things have already degenerated and loss of the uh, axons. So I think all that's important in the process, but again, details are still trying to be worked out. Okay, and then symptoms of MS can be extremely variable, and it depends on what part of the nervous system is affected. So the central nervous system consists of the cerebral hemispheres of the brain. You have the brain stem here, the cerebellum, uh, the spinal cord, and there's lots of nerves going in and out of the brain providing information. And so depending on what nerves are affected will dictate what types of symptoms uh, you may have. And it's almost akin to throwing darts at a dartboard in terms of the luck or lack of luck of affecting one area or another, and that may determine what types of symptoms you have. So it can be uh, hard to predict. It's an unpredictable disease. Um, and some people may have some of the symptoms, some may not. Some people may have multiple symptoms. Some may be uh, restricted to just one uh, system or part of the nervous system. So I think it's important to uh, understand that connection. There's certain symptoms that don't lend itself to anatomic localization, so you can't really tell, you know, what's causing fatigue. There's not a fatigue center of the brain uh, or one uh, single area. It seems to be an accumulation of multiple areas, um, but there, it's very hard for some symptoms to correlate with um, a, a particular part of the brain being injured. These are just some of the frequency of the symptoms. I won't go through a lot of those, but uh, fatigue is very common. Up to 90% of people may experience some degree of fatigue uh, during the course of their disease. Uh, you can see pain is fairly prominent between 55 and 80% to varying degrees, cognitive impairment. Uh, so all these things are um, variable from person to person, and um, we try to um, take the symptoms and then try to make some sense out of it and uh, determine what part of the nervous system might be affected, and then help, that helps us to set up and make the diagnosis. Okay, so talking a little bit about the management. Uh, for treatment of acute relapses, first of all, we want to know what a relapse is because people ask me that all the time, and that is it's a disturbance in brain function. So it can be in one part of the brain, uh, so if it's in the optic nerve, it can cause uh, blindness in one eye with pain. If it's in one limb, it may be uh, the nerves coming from a particular part of the spinal cord, or it may look like a stroke and have symptoms on one side of the body with numbness or weakness, or it may be a spinal cord lesion that uh, produces numbness from the waist down or the uh, chest down. So it depends on what part of the uh, area of the nervous system is effect affected. And by convention, it has to last at least 24 hours. Um, 
sometimes the symptoms can fluctuate, but you usually like at least 30 days between uh, relapses. So when one ends and the next one begins, if you're starting to see a, a one right after the other, that's probably part of the same process that never healed. Whereas if you're getting at least 30 days separation, then you're, uh, you're probably dealing with a different part of the nervous system. Uh, there can be certain things that can mimic uh, an MS relapse, such as the environmental factors, heat, um, dehydration, so forth, metabolic factors, uh, such as uh, too much uh, too, or too little salt or sugar. Um, uh, other metabolic processes are like thyroid diseases can affect it. Infectious processes that uh, may cause direct effects or may just through fever cause a slowing down of the nerves and that might generate some of the symptoms or worsening some of the symptoms. So we have to exclude all those things before we can say uh, with certainty that that's um, what's happening. And it's important for you to let the doctor know uh, or the nurse know um, exactly what symptoms you're having. So if you've developed a fever uh, within the last few days or you're developing urinary tract infections or something, some symptoms that suggest an infection elsewhere in the body, it's important to let your uh, providers know so that they can uh, figure that out and not jump to the conclusion that all you need is steroids and we'll fix the problem. We really have to sometimes do a urinalysis, a culture, we might have to do a chest x-ray, we might have to do blood work to try to determine if there's some el something else going on uh, that's um, mimicking the symptoms. And the symptoms can be extremely variable in location, severity and duration. And just because you have a minor symptom doesn't mean it's a minor problem. It may actually be something you want to discuss with your physicians and uh, make sure it's addressed. So don't just discount it until you've had a chance to discuss that. And there's not always a good correlation between what you're experiencing symptom-wise and what is happening on the MRI. How many times do we see people time and time again uh, have symptoms that sound like an exacerbation? They go through an MRI and the MRI is the same as it was six months or a year or two years ago. And why is that? Either we're missing the area that we're looking in. In other words, if your symptom is in one leg or you're having bladder changes uh, and you're looking in the brain, you've looked probably in the wrong area. You need to look at the spine as well. So it may be what area is being imaged uh, that may give you an idea as to what uh, uh, the cause is. Uh, but sometimes you just don't see the changes. The changes are too minute uh, within the uh, nervous system and we just may not be able to pick them up. And these are just some of the treatments. The acute relapses can be treated with IV or oral steroids. Uh, sometimes we'll use uh, ACTH or Actar gel if the problem uh, doesn't respond to steroids or people can't tolerate steroids. Sometimes we use um, high doses of oral steroids, particularly if they can't tolerate IVs. Um, and then we have to understand some of the, the risks of taking steroids, particularly long-term. Long-term steroids can be pretty devastating, can cause problems such as cataracts and bone degeneration, uh, infections, and so forth. So we have to be particularly careful about uh, overusing steroids, but use it when we need it and use it quickly in the early part of the exacerbation. Okay, and then there are other things that can be used if the steroids or ACTH fail, and those are things like plasmapheresis and IVIG and uh, other immunosuppressants that can uh, help suppress the immune response. And sometimes we do have to go on to uh, other things if someone's doing uh, poorly and not responding to the traditional therapies. We know that the cost of steroids is much lower than these other therapies, uh, but the insurance companies almost always want you to try steroids first. If you're someone who can't tolerate steroids, you don't have to keep trying them over and over again. You just need to uh, make sure the physician records that in the record so they know they don't have to keep trying each time. Uh, it may be that it's just not working for you anymore and you do have to go to something else. These are some of the uh, pain syndromes that are associated with MS. And up to 55 to 63% of uh, MS patients may have pain at some time during their uh, course of MS. And it may be mild, it may be moderate, it may be severe. It may be something that's more of a nuisance. It may be something that's completely incapacitating. So the numbers don't really tell you uh, for a given person how much they're impacted. Uh, trigeminal neuralgia is the one we associate as being one of the more severe acute pain syndromes. And it can occur between 2 and 9% of MS patients. Uh, it's described as electric, 
um, sometimes sharp, shooting, burning, uh, sometimes boring. It tends to either come on uh, as a sudden uh, pain that dissipates right away, or it may occur in a series of jabs, or it may come in, uh, in waves, one right after the other, every 30 seconds, every minute. And so people describe them differently. Uh, if it's just an occasional thing, it may be something that's easy to uh, tolerate or easy to manage. Uh, but when they're more constant, and more severe, and more persistent, that's when we try to look at various uh, ways of treating them. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Some of the triggers for trigeminal neuralgia is anything that involves the trigeminal nerve, which is the uh, sensory um, nerve of the face. And it's divided into three divisions, the first, second, and third division, because we like things simple. Uh, we've got an ophthalmic division, uh, then the max, uh, the uh, uh, mid portion and then the mandibular portion. Um, if, uh, if you touch a certain area, you may be able to trigger that. If air blows on it, like for an air conditioning or from the wind blowing, that may be enough to trigger it. If you talk, sometimes that'll trigger it, uh, brushing your teeth. Uh, it can be variable from person to person. Other neuralgias, there's glossopharyngeal neuralgia, which involves the glosso, which is the, the tongue involving the, the, involving the tongue, uh, pharyngeal, meaning the pharynx. And so there's a nerve that becomes uh, irritated in that distribution, and when you swallow uh, or you try to um, sp uh, speak sometimes, that nerve may trigger in a different distribution that's down lower in the throat. Uh, we also have occipital neuralgias that can come up over the top from the back, intercostal neuralgias that occur in, uh, usually in a circumferential area or can be very severe around the rib cage. Sometimes it's around the uh, both sides and can be confused with the MS hug. Uh, oftentimes people will have it, if they have it over the left side of the chest, they automatically think that it's uh, uh, heart related and people go through sometimes very expensive testing. And sometimes if you have a lot of uh, heart, uh, heart attack risk factors, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, cholesterol, uh, and you're older or in your middle age and older years, uh, then it would be appropriate to make sure it's not a cardiac event. But once you've done that, um, oftentimes just treating for neuralgia is enough to uh, suppress that pain pretty dramatically. Uh, there's something called a Lermite sign. Everybody knows how to spell that, right? L-H-E-R-M-I-T-T-E, possibly yes. Uh, that, that was um, uh, described by a German physician who uh, described a typical um, MS symptom of when you flex your neck down, it produces an electric shock down your spine, goes down your neck into the lower part of the spine. And that can occur in up to a quarter of the patients. But it's due to um, a plaque that's within the cervical spine. So it's an important recognition. It can be sometimes seen with uh, slipped discs in the cervical spine or tumors. Uh, but when someone in a younger age group has that, uh, we start to think more in terms of MS. Other pain syndromes, uh, dysesthesias, which are some of those same uncomfortable tingling sensations, sometimes even itching, uh, burning, uh, pins and needles are described. And that can be um, usually in the legs. It can occur in the hands. It's usually an indicative of spinal cord uh, disease. Uh, but that can be a pretty troublesome pain syndrome in patients with MS. Uh, and it's important to describe the symptom to your physician so they can uh, prescribe the appropriate treatment. Usually the simple things like over-the-counter medicines, uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatory medicines, steroids, uh, pain medicines, narcotics do not work as well for, uh, for the nerve type pain. The MS hug is a little bit vague in the sense that we feel it as a constricted feeling around the chest wall. It's probably partly muscular but it also is neurogenic because it occurs more commonly in people with spinal cord disease. Uh, muscle cramps and spasms can occur in up to 50% of patients, uh, headaches and optic neuritis. So we're going to talk about headaches in more detail in a few minutes. So optic neuritis can actually be painful. So if someone's developed uh, blindness or dimming of vision in one eye, uh, if it's due to the optic nerve, it's often painful. And when you think about the optic nerve, the optic nerve is uh, lying free within the uh, orbit, which is a bony structure and it takes the information from your eye back into the brain. And when you turn your eye, you're stretching and moving your optic nerve, and that can be very painful during the acute setting of optic neuritis. How many people have experienced the pain of optic neuritis? Okay, a few. Mm -hmm. So it can be, it's a fairly common phenomenon. 
Um, so I think it's something to pay attention to if uh, that occurs. Okay, some of the things that we can treat the pain with that don't involve medication are things like uh, what we call non-pharmacologic stretching, uh, pressure gloves or stockings, ice packs, massage therapy, physical therapy, biofeedback, meditation, yoga, tai chi, acupuncture, relaxation therapy, water and electric light uh, intake, and so forth. So any combination of those things may help. The fact that there's so many on the list means that they're probably not going to be as effective for the more severe pain syndromes. But it's a good idea to try some of those things first. Uh, some of the things we use for, uh, from a medication standpoint, you can sometimes use um, uh, supplements. Some people like to try over-the-counter supplements, and there are some things out there. There's CBD oil, there's uh, some topical things like asper cream, and there's um, even some, I think, um, some over-the-counter preparations for pain, for neuro neuropathic pain in Walgreens and other drugstores that you can get. Um, but they may not help, especially if it's a severe pattern. Uh, we, we often use medicines that are geared more towards nerve pain and leave the narcotics for very last. Uh, so we're talking about things like the seizure medications, Tegretol, Trileptol, Lyrica, Neurontin, Dilantin, Depakote. Uh, the last two, Dilantin and Depakote, can actually be given intravenously if someone has a very severe pain syndrome. So if they're in the hospital, they can be given intravenously and provide relief. Uh, antidepressants can be very helpful. Some of them actually have uh, not only antidepressant effects, but also pain relieving effects. And the number one question I always get is why am I getting an antidepressant if I'm not depressed? And that's because it has dual effects. It not only affects uh, depression and mood, but it also has a direct effect on the pain centers of the brain. So things like uh, the, trip, the uh, tricyclic agents, amitriptyline, amipramine, dizipramine, uh, duloxetine, some of the antipsychotic medications for the same reason can be very helpful and can tone down pain. So some of the things like Novine, Novine Melarel, Thorazine, some of the older medicines uh, we used to use pretty freely and were ex exceptionally helpful uh, for people um, if other things had failed. And then we talked a little bit about things like the CBD oil, medical marijuana, and low-dose naltrexone may help some people with um, their pain syndromes. Muscular pain is treated a little bit differently, sometimes similar. Uh, so we have things like the antispasmodics, baclofen, tizanidine, cyclobenzaprine, or flexoril. Uh, the anti-inflammatory medicines like non-steroidals and steroidals. Uh, we have the antidepressants, again, that can help with muscular pain. Anti-epileptic medications can help some people. Uh, and things like the opiates, which I love, put way down on the list and have gotten a bad name because people are overusing them and using them in the wrong combinations. So there's been a big mood to try to minimize opiates in, the, in our population because of accidental or sometimes purposeful deaths that occur due to opiate overdoses. If you use too many sedative medications, an opiate plus a, a benzodiazepine like Valium or Xanax uh, or an anti uh, spasmodic medication, these things have sedative effects, and when you have sedative effects, you also have respiratory depressant effects, and you add them together, and the effects are magnified. So people may not, you know, have a problem taking them individually, but they start combining them, and they may take a little bit too much and end up with an accidental overdose uh, and have either death or major problems resulting. So we're trying to get uh, people to understand that, I think to get away from using these medicines and try to find other alternatives. Uh, physicians about uh, 15 years ago were told that we were under treating pain, we really needed to move uh, towards uh, pain relief, get patients pain free, uh, give them opiates if it's appropriate. And so there was a big move at that time to develop all these opiate medications, the oxycodones and the oxycontin and so forth. And so we thought we were providing a service um, and we were, but we didn't realize the unintended consequences were that people would either abuse them or use them in the wrong combinations, the wrong doses, uh, sell them on the street, and all kinds of things. So uh, we've shifted now 180 degrees back the other way, and it's almost impossible to get uh, narcotics now compared to what we had before. And that's happening all over the country. In Florida, we have uh, House Bill 21, which has really um, restricted our use uh, to uh, four to seven days of use for acute pain. Um, so it's really putting a um, uh, much different look on and take on trying to control those opiates and not um, 
uh, depend on them uh, in lieu of some of these other approaches. So there are lots of approaches to pain. We just need to find ways to uh, do that that uh, don't get people into trouble long term. Okay, and then there are procedures that can be done. There are nerve blocks. Uh, Botox can be injected uh, for different kinds of headache syndromes and pain syndromes, glycerol, phenol. Uh, there are sympathetic nerve blocks, pain pumps, electric stimulators, both topical and uh, implantable stimulators in the spinal cord of the brain. Uh, there's balloon angioplasty where you can actually put a balloon uh, into the area around the trigeminal nerve and uh, actually inflate the balloon and compress the nerve and uh, calm the pain down that way. Uh, there are surgical procedures where you can go in and actually uh, uh, send, either you can cut the nerves or you can go in and uh, do what's called radiosurgery and send a beam of radiation directly to the trigeminal nerve and that can calm it down. There's gamma knife, which is what we just talked about. There's microvascular decompression, which is a surgical procedure where they go in uh, to the back of the brain on the outside and they cushion uh, between the blood vessel and the nerve to try to prevent that blood vessel from constantly uh, irritating the nerve and causing the pain syndrome, which can occur in some people. It tends to be more common in older people. In MS patients, they tend to have a direct effect from the brain stem rather than an effect like um, blood vessels, which is usually an older population. Uh, muscular pain can be treated with things like intrathecal baclofen, uh, sometimes uh, with either baclofen, narcotics, or both. Uh, Botox injections, trigger point injections, uh, with or without steroids. So there are lots of modalities that the pain management physicians can provide that um, uh, can reduce pain. And again, it's a matter of uh, determining the cause of the pain, trying to determine whether um, people will respond to the simpler measures or whether you have to escalate the therapy to uh, stronger, stronger interventions. So let's talk about migraine. Any, how many people have migraine? So about a third to a half of the audience. How many of those people with migraine also have MS? Okay, same number. So you can see how common this is. So uh, up to 27% of people with MS may have true migraine. Uh, as we saw on that other slide, uh, headache syndromes may occur in over 40% but true migraine can occur commonly. So there seems to be something that's predisposing to a higher risk. Uh, migraine is the third most disabling condition under age 50, so it's important to recognize. Uh, migraine symptoms can often mimic MS symptoms. So uh, sometimes people have trouble understanding the differences, and with things like migraine, typical, uh, the typical approach with migraine is someone comes in with a visual aura, so they start to have visual difficulties. Oftentimes it's flashing lights or quivering or uh, like um, uh, waves coming off the cement and sometimes it's uh, flashes of light, sometimes it's zigzags. Uh, I had a gentleman in uh, residency who's an engineer who actually drew out a three-dimensional image of a whole fort, of a bright fortification spectrum which showed the fort and, uh, in 3D. It was pretty remarkable. I should have kept it and or have them sell it, but it's pretty impressive. Uh, but uh, the migraine auras tend to last anywhere from five minutes to 60 minutes, and then they're followed by uh, the headache. Some people don't have the headache after. Sometimes people just have the migraine aura, sometimes called or referred to as ocular migraine. Um, the optic neuritis that occurs is something that typically uh, causes a dimming of vision. So that's what a, we call a negative phenomenon as opposed to migraine, which is a positive phenomenon. It's usually bright, flashing, uh, jagged lines, and so forth. Even seizures can do the same thing. It has bright phenomenon, but seizures tend to last a short time, usually a minute or two. So with migraine, it tends to last 60 minutes or less. With the optic neuritis, the uh, negative effect or the drop in vision uh, with pain um, usually lasts 24 hours or longer as an exacerbation, and oftentimes can be days, weeks, or even uh, can be permanent. So it's important to recognize those uh, very early. Now sometimes people will have what's called status migranosis, where they have a series of migraines right in a row, and it seems like I'm an MS attack because they're just having it continuously. And both of those um, conditions, both the status migranosis and the MS attacks, can be treated with steroids successfully, and that will calm those things down. Uh, people with migraine can have what's called 
uh, hemisensory phenomenon where they have numbness on one side of the body, again, usually lasting 30 to 60 days. People with seizures may have uh, weakness on one side of the body or after they have jerking. Uh, people with migraine can have uh, weakness on one side of the body called hemiplegic migraine. MS patients can have numbness or weakness on one side of the body. So again, the thing that tells you it's different is the company it keeps. So if you have someone who comes in consistently with weakness or numbness on one side of the body, lasting 60 minutes, followed by a migraine-type headache, those people, more likely or not, have migraine. If you're talking about something that comes on without the headache, sometimes with a dull headache, and may last days or even weeks, those patients are different. And those are the patients that we think of as MS patients. Um, I've seen a number of patients with seizures who have convulsive activity on one side of the body, and then they're left with weakness. Usually the weakness goes away within an hour or a few hours, but it can last several days too. So if you didn't, if you didn't see the actual seizure occur, you may not realize that the person had uh, this leftover weakness, then you say, well, is it a, a stroke or is it an MS attack? Is it a migraine attack? Is it seizures? You don't know until you take the history or you actually do a scan. So, um, so migraine uh, can occasionally accompany or rarely can be the main symptom of an MS attack. That's pretty unusual. Um, now, any change in the migraine pattern, especially frequency, location, or new associated symptoms with that headache, you have to think that's a big red flag for uh, intracranial processes like tumors or abscesses or other types of infection. So if someone's having a change in their um, migraine pattern, pay attention. I had a woman who was um, approximately 45 or 50 years ago who had occasional migraine. She'd have migraine about once every six months, and she also had MS. Her MS was very well controlled. And all of a sudden, her migraine pattern started to change. And she started coming in with two migraines a month. I said, that doesn't sound right. Something's not right. So we did an MRI uh, with contrast, and she had multiple enhancing nodules throughout the brain, not uh, typical of her MS, uh, not, certainly not present from, uh, from the migraine. Uh, but when we actually did a biopsy of one of these lesions, it turned out to be um, a uh, type of tumor that had spread from uh, it's called a carcinoid tumor that had spread from her appendix uh, into the brain, caused multiple lesions. And she went to um, a cancer center and had it treated and survived probably for another year until she passed away. So, I mean, you have to pay attention to those kinds of patterns that change like that because it sometimes can be a warning. We tend to throw everything back on, you know, it's probably just migraine, it's probably just MS, or it's probably just migraine. You got to pay attention and think outside the box. Okay, and the treatments tend to be pretty much the same. Um, you know, for, uh, the migraine treatment is similar to what we would expect with migraine in people who don't have MS, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so for any kind of migraine treatment, you're really looking at lifestyle changes, and more and more you're hearing that for MS, but it's also critical for migraine. So diet, exercise, proper sleep, uh, reducing and dealing with stress all play important roles uh, in treating migraine. It's amazing how people don't recognize that, you know, the stress level at work has gone up and now all of a sudden their migraines are going up. Uh, they've had uh, stress at home with their kids or spouses and the migraine pattern starts to get worse. We have to pay attention to those things and deal with them. Um, I've had people who can eliminate their uh, migraine headaches just by getting into an exercise program of three, uh, aerobic exercise three to five times a week, getting onto a, a good balanced diet. Okay, and then there's supplements that can sometimes help. So there's something called butter burr, magnesium, vitamin B2 in one pill called Migravent or MigraClear, which is an over-the-counter preparation. Uh, there's also things like melatonin, CoQ10, and I had one patient tell me that when they started taking CBD by um, under the tongue, that their migraines went away. So it, who knows, it's a study of one person. I can't really vouch for that, but it may be something to consider. Um, the medications that we've used traditionally for acute treatment that work the best are the triptans. So you have Imitrex, which is sumatriptan, uh, Zomig, Zomatriptan, Maxalt, which is rivotriptan, uh, uh, and all those are, um, have been around for over 10 years and been remarkably effective. They can come in uh, injectable form, nasal form, and oral form uh, as a tablet. 
There's also something called Migranol, which is an old formulation. It uh, is actually DHE45, which you used to give uh, as an intravenous formulation. Uh, then they uh, uh, put it into a nasal form, and that has worked very well. Um, one of the, uh, well, I won't tell that story this time, but the, the NSAIDs can be very effective, aspirin and caffeine. Some people just, when they're first getting their migraine, will take an aspirin and a cup of coffee and their migraine goes away. And probably because the aspirin has direct effects uh, as an anti-inflammatory, and then the caffeine constricts blood vessels, which has a positive effect for the, the migraine. Sometimes that's enough to treat the migraines. Uh, butalbital can be helpful in thing, when people aren't responding to other things, but the big risk with butalbital or furacet or furanol is that it can be addictive, so you don't want to end up using it too often. If you're using it more than uh, once a week, there's a higher risk that you may end up getting uh, dependent on it, and then it's hard to get off of it. Uh, but for occasional use, it's not a bad preparation. Uh, there are things like um, that we use for prevention. So the anticonvulsants, to Topamax or Topiramate, uh, Valproy, which is uh, Depakote. Antidepressants can be effective. Antihypertensives, such as Indoral or Propranolol. Uh, aspirin can be used as a preventative, memantine. So a number of things have been shown to prevent uh, migraines. There's also injectable, uh, something called anti-CGRP, which um, we've discovered in the last 10 years is a remarkable part of the migraine mechanism. And they've now developed three new agents on the market. They're injectable once a month to sometimes every two to three months. Uh, they can be extremely effective. They work very differently than a lot of the other medicines. They work directly on the migraine me mechanism. Uh, CGRP stands for calcitonin gene-related peptide. Glad I got that out. And so uh, those things can be very hel helpful in uh, suppressing the migraines before they ever occur. So I've had a number of patients try them, and it can be pretty dramatic. So it's very exciting to have a new type of preventative medicine. We've also used things um, such as Botox, which can help. Uh, we've had nerve stimulators, some that you can wear as a headband, which may help. Uh, some are uh, trigeminal nerve stimulators, vagal nerve stimulator. There's a device that you can put up against the vagus or near the vagus nerve and turn it on, and it stimulates and can abort a migraine. So that can help some people. So that's interesting. Uh, there's also nerve blocks such as sphenopalatine or greater occipital nerve blocks that can help a lot of people. So again, when you have a serious disorder that doesn't respond to one therapy, there's usually multiple options, and that's what we have with migraine, we have it with MS, and uh, a number of other conditions. Okay, so I'm not gonna do a lot of uh, talking about the disease modifiers. I'll give you some basic principles, uh, but I won't get into a lot of details about individual ones unless you uh, wish to discuss it during Q&A, but let's go through a couple things. So the timing of therapy, we realize, is very important. So we know that without treatment uh, and without the disease modifiers, uh, people go through a certain course, and the vast majority of people, 75% or more, have relapsing MS, which after a period of 30, 40 years uh, may progress into a secondary progressive form and may accumulate disability over time. And that's where those nerves are dying out and having uh, problems without treatment. Uh, if you treat, but you don't treat early in the course, you can still get some benefit, but most of the benefit occurs if you treat right at the diagnosis. And we have studies that show if you look at patients on active drug versus placebo and you follow them over a course of time, usually after two years, the study changes so that the placebo group gets to switch over to the active group. And you can actually see the disability rates improve dramatically in the placebo group, but it never really catches up to the benefit that you see uh, with the active group that started from the very beginning. Uh, so it's important. I think we've learned a lot about treating as early as we can in the course of the disease because those uh, statistics are there over and over, one study after another. Okay, so we know that there's a preclinical phase that people uh, start to develop lesions that are uh, unrelated that we uh, just never have symptoms of, and you can make a diagnosis uh, by MRI if you're fortunate enough to happen to do an MRI. Uh, when someone's not having symptoms. So for example, if someone comes in with a head injury or comes in with headaches and they're doing their first MRI, sometimes you can find lesions on the brain that look typical of MS. 
and that's what we call radiographic isolated syndrome, or RIS. And if you follow those patients over time, a significant number will go on and develop MS. And they've actually done studies, if you look at lesions um, in the spinal cord as well as the brain, then people may have up to an 80% chance of developing full-blown MS. Uh, so I think it's important that if you find those things early on, uh, to follow those patients closely and maybe even consider uh, treatment at some point. A uh, tricky part is that we find in autopsy studies that people may have MS lesions that they never knew they had. Um, they may, may have never been sick enough to need an MRI. Um, and they live normal, healthy lives until the time that they had a heart attack and then died or whatever else that took their life. And you find lesions on the brain that look like MS. So what is that? You can't call that MS, but it is MS. It's just a more benign form. The problem is we don't know how to recognize which people are going to have a more benign form, which people are going to have a more aggressive form, and so you have to treat everybody with these treatments to prevent the vast majority of patients that will go on and develop problems. Question? Okay. 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 There you go. And we used to think that benign MS was common, but if you actually follow patients with benign MS uh, over 10, 30, 10, 20, 30 years and start looking at uh, them carefully, they may have some mild difficulties with cognition, they may have fatigue, they may have cut back on some of their activities. So it's not necessarily as benign as we used to think. And I don't recommend uh, autopsies to find out later. So. <laughs> so we then enter a relapsing remitting phase where people are starting to have their relapses over and over. And then you get into the secondary progressive phase and we start to uh, lose more and more uh, function and become more and more disabled. Okay. okay. Is that all? Okay. So these are the approved MS therapies. I'm not going to do that right now. But we have the interferons. We have uh, glutarimer, the monoclonal antibodies, the oral therapies. And if you want to discuss those later, we can. So what is your role and the responsibility in the uh, comprehensive health program? So basics, you want to educate yourself like you are here tonight to uh, know about the various treatments. Uh, we want to adjust the intensity of the treatment to the severity of your disease. So if someone has one attack every 10 years, that person may not need an MRI. If someone had a couple of attacks at the beginning and then stopped having attacks and they're not disabled, they're not having changes in their MRI, those patients may not need therapy. But if someone's having frequent attacks, if they're not recovering fully from the attacks, if you're African American, if you're a male, uh, those are the patients that tend to have a more stormy course, and those are the people we want to pay attention to and try to treat more aggressively because we want to prevent these things from accumulating and getting into problems. Okay, you got to be realistic. You know, this is not a cure, but we're on the way to a cure in the sense that treating early will prevent most of the disability. Uh, we're finding ways now to uh, Remyelinate. There are more agents that are being studied now for remyelination and neuroprotection. So you're going to see in the next five years a whole barrage of medicines coming out uh, that will be looking at that. There's a medicine that may be coming out uh, this year uh, that uh, you may see as an indication uh, for secondary progressive MS. Um, there may be things in the future that will look at trying to reduce the nerve damage that occurs. They may not have a big effect on the relapses. They may not have a big effect on the MRIs, uh, but they pre can prevent the disability that occurs. And so we may be seeing people using dual therapy. They use one therapy for the acute inflammation early in the disease. At the same time, we add in a second therapy that prevents the later degeneration, which as we talked about occurs early. So we may be able to impact the disease very early in the course and prevent the disability and the bad effects uh, later on. So I think those things are coming. Uh, that's the way we're moving. Uh, in the meantime, till those things come out, we're looking at lifestyle changes, avoiding tobacco, excessive alcohol, excessive marijuana, can, which can be uh, damaging, and also exercise, proper diet. And all those things seem to make a difference in slowing down the course and building what's called brain reserve. Uh, when you think about it, there's a lot of research that's been going on to try to prevent brain degeneration. So you hear about things like Alzheimer's and stroke, Parkinson's, MS. If you have people who are exercising regularly, if they're uh, on things like the Mediterranean diet, you can keep your brain reserve at a better level uh, so that you're not deteriorating as fast as the disease progresses. So we're actually affecting the aging process by slowing that down and be able to uh, prevent disability later on. That's 
been shown with a number of studies. Uh, there's a study in uh, what's called MCI, mild cognitive impairment, that actually looks at patients in the early stages potentially could develop into Alzheimer's and putting them through an exercise program, dietary program, and they uh, actually were able to slow down and a few of those patients went on to develop full-blown Alzheimer's. So we can do it. There are things that are coming out that will be very exciting in the next few years. So we just have to keep on top of it. Okay, you wanna treat early, stay positive, and stay committed to your therapy. So you wanna make sure you stay with the therapy. If you keep going on and off for various reasons or you're not communicating with your physician, uh, you may find that it uh, comes back to bite you later on. And I've seen a number of people that you know, had a tough time uh, tolerating medicines. They went from one to another to another, but they stuck with it as best they could. Uh, they may have tried five, six different therapies, maybe finally came up with uh, a therapy that's worked, uh, and they don't have any disability. It's because they kept on something during that time. They kept themselves healthy, and they're able to prevent the uh, uh, disability that can occur late. Uh, don't be afraid to change therapies, but on the other hand, uh, if you have something that's working, you want to stick with it. Okay, this is going to get a little tedious, so I'm going to try to rush through it a little bit. Uh, but you want to organize your medical history for yourself and for your family and for the physicians that you come into contact with. Uh, so you want to have organize your records. You have a listing of all your different providers, uh, the diagnoses, the medications that you've been on. Uh, medications that you've used in the past for disease modifiers as well as symptomatic therapy so you don't repeat and have to go through things that you already tried a few years earlier. Uh, you want to uh, keep lists of your labs, your MRIs, um, any surgeries that you've had. Make sure physicians are aware of what you've been through so you don't have to reinvent the wheel and start all over. Uh, you want to make sure you share test results. A lot of times people have duplication. They end up getting um, a set of blood counts and liver tests from one doctor, and a week later they have the same test from another doctor. And it's because there's not that kind of sharing, and the person's not thinking about, well, what blood tests did I have? The person need to be more proactive about what they're getting and what tests are being done. Um, there's a big, and I've experienced this personally with family members as well as with patients, um, the transition from home to hospital to rehab back home or to um, you know, chronic nursing care. And it's sometimes very difficult to keep that continuity going. Health First is trying to uh, optimize that, but unless you're on top of it, you know, if you let everything to chance and just assume that it's gonna get done, it doesn't get done. And so you have to be proactive about it. You have to know exactly what medicines you were taking before. Um, keep on top, keep talking to the doctors, understand what's going on with your care or with their with your uh, loved one's care, because um, if you don't, there won't be anyone else to really check on things and make sure it's being done right. So you wanna make sure there's a smooth transition. Sometimes you have these uh, resources, you can either do it on a piece of paper, or you can do it on a flash drive, you can do it in your cell phone, uh, but you have uh, ways of keeping information, and there are actually software programs that allow you to do that. So that can be very helpful at managing some of that information. Okay, make sure you have all the contacts um, listed. You know, one of the big problems that we're seeing is that when people try to get on these very expensive drugs and try to get uh, them paid for through various um, sources, is that there's not a lot of communication. So the communication breaks down because you're dealing with uh, the patient, you're dealing with the family, you're dealing with the physician, you're dealing with specialty pharmacy, dealing with the insurance company, you're dealing with the infusion center. Or you're dealing with the pharmaceutical company. So there's all these different players. And if you're not at the center of that wheel, that, that hub, and you're not controlling that, uh, communication breaks down very easily and you may not get your medicine. And by staying on top of it and being proactive and starting in advance, uh, you'll be able to print, prevent any uh, uh, delays in getting the medication. Make sure you keep the names and numbers handy. Okay, and just understand as much of the process as you can. So we talk about patient-centered care. Well, you are at the center of that patient-centered care, and you need to be in control, coordinate uh, with these various components, uh, make sure that things are done in a timely fashion, and never assume anything. I mean, time and time again, patients come in, well, I'm out of my medicine for the last two months. Well, did you call us? No. Did you call the insurance company? Or, uh, no. Did you call the specialty pharmacy? No. Did you call the pharmaceutical company that might be able to provide 
um, free drug? Did you call us so we can get you samples? I mean, all these things could have been um, um, corrected and we could have changed that and allowed you to keep on your medicine if you just take a few steps to be proactive and try to keep on top of that. So don't assume that people are going to do it for you because our health care system, uh, which used to be very different, as you know, has now become much more complex and very hard to keep communication. And one of the problems we have is the HIPAA laws, people are very frightened about sharing information, so they don't want to call when you're not home, or they don't want to call a number um, if, um, if they feel like it's someone that might uh, get your information by mistake. And so everybody's overly cautious, and that just adds more complexity. Okay, make sure you write down everything about your visit and medications, we talked about that. Uh, prioritizing things. So if you go into the doctor's office with a list of 10 items, I can guarantee we won't get to the 10 items. So you have to pick three important items that you want to address that time. If you feel like those others are important, well, either write it down for the physician, communicate through email or through other means, or set up another appointment a month, two months, three months down the road so you can address some of those other things. So you're not going to be, you have to be as productive as you can. You're not going to expect that you can go in there. And some people don't even bring a list. Some people come in and go, well, everything's fine. And I say, well, I start going down a list and everything's not so fine. And then, uh, so does that cover everything? Yes. So as I walk out of the office, they tell my nurse, oh, they forgot to tell you one thing. That's the most important. <laughs> so, I mean, you have to really have a plan for yourself and know exactly what you're going to talk about and what's important for you. Okay. So you want to stick with your therapy? Is it working for you? Are you having acceptable side effects or do you need to change? You know, MS is so unpredictable, you have to be on top of it. Okay, communicating with your health care provider and the other people we talked about, and then inter interacting through secure email, uh, letters, and so forth. Pharmaceutical companies, need, keeping in touch with them, they may be able to come up uh, with ways of getting the medication. We talked about some of the things. Okay, insurance companies, you have to um, interact with them because they are paying the bills. Um, so they can have all different kinds of programs depending on whether you're commercial insurance or Medicare, Medicaid. If you're underinsured or uninsured, uh, you have to make sure that there may that you're looking into different foundations that may be able to provide care and provide funding. And you may also even want to consider uh, some of the experimental trials that are available and that uh, you could participate in. Okay, be positive and proactive. Uh, try to educate and encourage Congress to expand access to MS disease-modifying therapies, and that's something that the National MS Society is doing, MS Views and News, all the different societies are trying to find ways to, to maintain and improve access to these expensive medications. You want to educate the public about MS and its impact on the families and society, and it's up to you to play at least a minimal role, if not a major role. And a little effort will go a long way to help with those things, okay, and improve your quality of life, and. Uh, you want to, the name of the game is try to uh, live as good a life as you can within your means and within your uh, uh, disabilities. Uh, make sure your family is involved and you're doing things for the right reasons. So one of my favorite uh, mottos is, uh, a good time occurs precisely when we lose track of what time it is. And that was actually on the side of a, uh, uh, a grill and bar uh, uh, in Charleston, South Carolina. So I've always, I, th I thought I had to have that. Uh, written down. Thank and you. this is uh, Melbourne Beach where I live. Come visit. Except there are a lot of restrictions over here. So. Thank you and appreciate your attention. Thank you. That was a lot of knowledge. If you guys didn't learn something, something's wrong there, all right? So now we're going to have Dr. Deletta. Deletta? Deletta? Oh my gosh. <laughs> She's got an R in her name. It really threw me off. Um, so I'm going to go around the room. Whoever's got questions, please raise your hand. I may be taking somebody else's. Just raise your hand. Let me acknowledge that you have a question. All right? They're going to have uh, microphones here. They'll be able to answer you. Again, the cameras are not on you. They're only going to be on doc the two doctors. I'm going to put it that way, OK? All right, so who's got a question? Oh, by the way. One germ, one mic, me. 
<laughs> I've been on Plaguerty Pen for um, four to five years now. Plaguerty Pen. And um, for the past two years, I've been having problems and had, um, in 2018, had another MRI, had one in 13, 16, and 18. And I have, um, I can't think of the word right now, m uh, brain atrophy. And I was wondering if it could be because of the plagiarity pen or because of the length of time that I've had MS or because it's time to change my medication. Okay, so I can give you some general information uh, and that is that MS in itself can cause brain atrophy. And it does so at, a, at an accelerated rate compared to the rest of the population. And we know that by multiple studies that have now looked at atrophy readings and we find that a lot of the newer medications are slowing that process down. Um, Plegarty is an excellent medicine, and it's up to you and your physician to talk about whether it's worthwhile continuing. Um, there are other choices that you can consider. The Plegarty itself, I've not heard about actually creating atrophy. It's just that it may not be preventing the atrophy, obviously. So that's something you, you should discuss with your physician. Okay. Um, and my physician said I shouldn't be able to feel my brain shrinking, but I sw swear I can. <laughs> yeah, you talked earlier, uh, Dr. Delittery, about uh, a testing or a battery of tests that you use specifically for MS patients. I've never heard or read anything on this before. Is this something new that just the two of you came up with? No, actually, this, this has been known for quite a number of years now, but it's not something that uh, is used routinely in most practices. Um, we've always had neuropsychologists that could do the more expanded battery, so people would do, you know, the five, six-hour tests, uh, sometimes doing it on two days uh, to get them accomplished. Uh, so it's something that's been available for quite some time, uh, but we uh, have noticed, and it's talked about in a number of the MS meetings, uh, where they have looked at specific targeted neuropsychological tests that are more common with MS. And uh, Dr. Dillette mentioned that. She mentioned, and I agree, it was the uh, uh, processing speed, attention span, uh, there's multitasking, there's short-term memory, and so forth. So all those are incorporated. There's a test called the symbol digit test, which allows people to uh, match symbols and digits and uh, how, uh, test how quickly it can occur, they can do that. Um, and these tests are all reproducible. Uh, they've been shown to be effect, uh, to demonstrate deficits in MS patients. Um, and you can also monitor, monitor patients over time. So you could do it now in six months or 12 months and see an actual deterioration even if the person's not fully aware of that decline. And if that's the case, you can use that as another parameter for disability. So just like we talk about things like the time 25 foot walk where you can time yourself walking 25 feet with a stopwatch going to that point and back again and then uh, measuring that over time. Uh, you can do fine motor coordination. You can do what's called the nine hole peg test. Uh, and there are a number of psychological tests. There's the pace out that used to be used more commonly, but um, this single digit test and then the neuro tracks which we're using as an electronic uh, computerized version, all these target the specific parts of uh, MS cognition, and so if we're seeing that change, even if the person's walking the same, talking the same, using good normal fine motor movement, have good strength, if they're losing cognition, that's something to pay attention with. We do that also with uh, visual testing. Some people do visual field testing. We look at OCT and so forth. So all these are ways of looking at different brain functions and then seeing if they're changing over time. That's another measure of disability, and it tells us that the medicine may or may not be working at that point. And just to add to that, what we have added to the battery that Dr. Gold and I came up with is the emotional component. So we we do some screening measures for depressive and anxiety symptoms because everybody thinks of depression. People have different thoughts of how depression manifests itself. A lot of people think you you can't function or you're sad, you're depressed, you're in, you know curled up in a ball. But there's several ways that man that depression manifests itself. So we have a measure that looks at all the different symptoms that may accompany depression, indicate some depressive mood disorder, 
or anxiety disorder. We also dig a little deeper. If there is a history of a psychiatric condition, we do an additional test for that. But that will give us an idea of both the cognitive and the emotional aspects of functioning. And we like to track those, like you said, over time to see if there are any fluctuations or changes um, with the disease process. And you can, if you look at patients like we have now over the last uh, couple of years, uh, you see some patterns. So you have some people that have purely emotional, some people have purely physical, some people have a mixed pattern. And I can tell you right away that the mixed pattern is the most common uh, occurrence, and that's because we all have combinations of emotional and physical aspects. But very rarely do you have someone who comes in with purely uh, physical or purely emotional. Uh, we can also, depending on what we're finding on the test, we can target our treatments, my treatments, uh, as well as the uh, psychological testing uh, towards those deficits. So if someone's coming in with anxiety, you can look at anxiety treatments. If you're looking at depression, deal with that. If you're dealing with something we see quite often is which, uh, which is an attention deficit. Uh, there are a number of medicines that can work to focus attention and improve speed of processing. So very similarly, you may have people that start out with attention deficit as children, uh, it doesn't go away, and they may continue to have that as adults, and so we target the treatments towards that if that's a prominent part of it. Um, so all those things can be work, uh, done at the same time, uh, but we usually target our treatment to specific um, findings on those tests. Next questions here. Um, I've had um, allergic rhinitis um, throughout my life, but... Um, I'm having more trouble with sinus infections now, um, but you've got that on the list of autoimmune, so I didn't allergic, understand. There is a condition called allergic rhinitis that yeah. is autoimmune, so it can be an autoimmune process. Okay, but it's not necessarily they related. They call it allergies, you know, but yeah. sometimes that's a true allergic response or uh, autoimmune response. Okay, so it could be an MS response or just... No, it's separate no, from it's just, separate from MS. Okay, but it's something that people can treat um, with certain medications, just okay. like they would other autoimmune diseases. Okay. Thank you. Next question. My gosh, I got a question for you. Ah, uh, okay. I don't remember it right now. One second. <laughs> I think you need to see Julie. I'm available for testing. I, I'm terrible with this. <laughs> biomarkers. What can you tell us about biomarkers now? Okay, biomarkers are interesting. Um, biomarkers mean that you can measure certain biological or chemical substances uh, that allow you to follow the course of a disease. Um, it's been extremely frustrating not having something that would allow us to tell um, the course of MS as we're treating it. I mean, at one point we had nothing. We didn't have MRIs. Um, but MRI has become the biggest, the most important uh, biomarker because it allows us to see the actual lesions, especially in the earlier phases of the disease. Um, they are coming up with a number of things that we may be able to use. There's something called neurofibrils and that may come out as a blood test that you can see for active disease in MS. Uh, the problem is that is it's not specific to MS. It can be seen with other conditions like strokes and Alzheimer's. So, the problem is that those um, things aren't necessarily specific for MS, but they can give an indication. Um, for a while, they were talking about how the interferons worked, and uh, there's something called neopterin and some other chemicals that you could actually measure, but it never became commercially available. Uh, you can look at antibody responses against uh, the interferons. Uh, that can, can be considered a biomarker. Uh, you can look at JC virus uh, becoming positive, and that's another biomarker that might uh, be followed in certain patients who uh, are on medications that might predispose to uh, JC virus or PML. Uh, so those are just some of the biomarkers that have been used uh, that are constantly looking. In fact, they, this is something we've been doing for over 10 years, trying to find something that would allow us to, to tell whether our treatment is working. There's actually something called a chip array where they would take blood and put it onto a, a microchip and actually um, uh, map out on that chip thousands of different genes. And you can do it beforehand and then afterwards, and it would tell you whether you're seeing the proper pattern um, of, let's say, an interferon. So an interferon turns on certain genes, turns off in certain genes, 
And if it's in a pattern that looks like a positive response, meaning that the person's responding, uh, then you call that a good response to that, in a, in a sense, a biomarker. The problem with that is we haven't expanded that to all the different drugs. We don't have enough information about how it's um, working with, e with each of the different disease modifiers. It's not cheap enough to be able to use routinely as a commercial product. So uh, there's still some limitation, but that's an exciting um, type of biomarker to be able to follow if it ever comes to fruition. Dr. Gold, I'm just kind of going, going back in when you were talking about the um, understanding of MS since time, like whenever, and you mentioned something about flares in the fingers. What was something called D Dawson's fingers? Dawson's fingers. I okay, remember. so it was named after the Professor Dawson that you saw in the slide, but Dawson found these um, projections pathologically, and basically they're uh, cells and, and plaques that radiate out from the fluid-filled spaces from the ventricular surface. Um, I don't really have a, a slide that shows that, but um, so you have these um, inflammatory lesions that come out from the surface, and that's very, very typical of what we see in MS patients. So Dr. Dawson, Professor Dawson had discovered it many years ago, and on our MRIs we started to see those patterns very commonly. So the way you tell is uh, there's a sequence called sagittal flare imaging on the MRI where you look at sagittal images, which is a side view, and you look at flare images, which is a fluid attenuated, which means it uh, calms down the fluid, so all you see are the lesions. And you can see those finger-like projections off the surface, and those are almost always, if they're present, can be um, very typical, almost pathognomonic, which means it's diagnostic of MS, so it can be an extremely helpful finding. So that's the pattern that we were seeing. Dr. Dillette. Do you recommend for people with cognitive problems like myself, word games? Word games. Um, anything that you can do that's novel for the brain, something new, something that is um, your brain has to make different connections to think outside the box. So a lot of people say, oh, I read, I read. Well, that's fabulous. You definitely want to do something. But reading is a very automatic activity that we've done for years and years and years. And we can do that pretty easily and quickly, passively. Um, you need something a little bit more active and interactive with the brain. So there's some things online that you don't have to pay for. A lot of them they want you to pay for. But um, there's some word activities or word games online where you have to formulate words in your brain out of a couple of letters or um, solve puzzles, something that you're not used to doing, novel ideas so that you can try to make some new connections. Do you work with people on retraining the brain? I do not do rehab, rehabilitation therapy. I, we, that is a huge need in this community. We just got neuropsychology on, on board in this area. There was only one or two other neuropsychologists in the entire county one of which is now retiring, I'm the other one, and we just hired somebody else in our practice. So we have our neuropsychologist, we're hoping to expand our practice to include uh, rehabilitation therapy. The closest we have in the community is occupational therapy and speech therapy. They do do some cognitive retraining if needed. Can you please explain to the audience what cognitive retraining is all about? Sure. So we do cognitive evaluations. We look at all the different parts of the brain that we can output-wise. We see, like we discussed before, memory, language, attention, concentration, processing, speed. Everybody's going to have strengths and weaknesses within those domains, but we want to see the big discrepancies of where you should be and where you are functioning. And again, we all lose, well, I didn't say this before, but we all lose a little memory or cognitive functioning as we get older. Unfortunately, MS may exacerbate that. So we find out the areas of the brain that are not working as well as they should, and those can be targeted through cognitive retraining. So there's practices and exercises that will focus on attention, processing speed, concentration, trying to do some things in those areas of the brain to make them work better, find new connections. So Dr. Gold, going forward from there, when a patient comes to you and they have this major cognition issue, and they walk into you and you ask them what's wrong with their memory, and they say, I can't remember, where do you go from there? How do you, how do you assess it to be MS-related or age-related? Well, that's a good question. I think part of it is just taking a good history and understanding how the patient's functioning day-to-day -day in their lives, uh, whether they're functioning well at work, um, use, utilizing other people in contacts like their uh, family to 
uh, help understand if there is any changes. And sometimes it can be very difficult to differentiate when things are falling away from uh, normal when they're not. So uh, we try to get that information together. Um, a lot of it is trying to um, also look at their medication list, see if there's something that might be interfering with their memory. A number of medicines, um, such as the what we call the benzodiazepine class, like Valium, Xanax, Clonopin, those things can actually interfere with memory. Uh, you look at things that are interfering with their sleep, so either stimulants that might be keeping them awake at night, uh, stresses that might be keeping them awake, sleep disorders such as sleep apnea or restless legs or things that are keeping them awake at night. And then um, because they're not getting full restorative sleep at night, they're not going to function as well during the day. So I think there are a number of things that you can look towards that are treatable and reversible. Um, I mean, if you spend all your time on just looking at Alzheimer's, looking at um, uh, MS alone, uh, and then you miss some of the treat easily treatable things, uh, and I think that's a, a disservice. So I think it's important to look at those kinds of other things that are contributing to the memory problems. Great. Anybody have a question yet? I'm hoping I'm getting your brains going here. Hi. I have a question. Dr. Gold, I saw on your um, information that you were talking about by migraines, and you talked about caffeine. I personally, having MS, I avoid all caffeine just as part of my situation. I truly avoid caffeine altogether. But I do, I do want to ask you about why caffeine for migraines, number one. Number two, I wanted to ask, tell you, I also do a, a set testing on my computer called Luminosity, and that really has helped me with my speed of cognitive ability. And I really love that. Um, I would try, anybody can try this. It's awesome. Please that's, that's try excellent. it out. Yeah, I've heard a it's lot of really good, good things about it. So caffeine, um, there's been a lot of studies looking at caffeine, their pros, its pros and cons and so forth. Uh, it does act as a stimulant. It does help with cognition uh, and speed of processing. The problem is, is it's too short acting. So uh, especially if you're taking coffee in the morning, it may wear off within two or three hours. Uh, if you're drinking coffee every day, all day long, then you start to lose the effect and uh, you basically become immune to its positive effects. Uh, uh, so I think the caffeine is um, um, kind of has its pros and cons. It has been um, shown to cause vasoconstriction, which constricts some of the blood vessels. And uh, with migraine, one of the mechanisms is um, we go through a constrictive phase in migraine where there's slowing of blood flow to certain areas of the brain, which may lead to the numbness, which may lead to the uh, visual aura. Uh, and then as a rebound, the brain reacts by dilation of the vessels. And when the vessels dilate, you get the blood pulsating through the dilated blood vessel, inflamed blood vessel, and that's producing that throbbing headache. So caffeine will keep things in a constricted phase and prevent that dilated phase. That's one of the theories. So it does seem to do that very well. Caffeine combined with uh, aspirin and acetaminophen has a potentiating effect. Uh, for pain relief, so it seems to have a positive effect that way. <clears throat> so there are, seems to be more positive effects in caffeine than negative. Um, obviously, if you're drinking too much caffeine, it can cause excessive urination. Uh, it can cause problems with urgency of urination if you already have that. Um, there have been, um, study, obviously, it can interfere with sleep if you take it too late in the day. And that goes for all kinds of caffeine. So you're talking about uh, ca uh, coffee, tea, chocolate, uh, things of that sort that can keep you awake through the night. Uh, there was a study done, there have been a number of studies done in Parkinson's that show a beneficial effect. Um, again, there haven't, the, the studies that have shown negative effects have been far, out, far outweighed by the uh, things that have shown beneficial effects. But again, you, everything in moderation, so, yes. You used the term pathognomonic earlier. I was just wondering if you could expound on that. Pathognomonic is just something that gives you a definite diagnostic uh, findings. So, for example, there are se several findings in MS that seem to uh, tip you off to being almost exclusively in MS, and there's really nothing that's 100 percent, but if you have someone that comes in and they have what's called an INO, internuclear ophthalmoplegia, in other words, they look with their eyes and they're not moving together, so the eyes may move like this or like this or like that, so they're not moving together. 
Uh, that means that there's a pathway in the brainstem that is producing that abnormality, and that's seen very commonly in MS. If you see it in a young person and it it's present on both sides, that's almost pathognomonic or diagnostic of MS. Um, the Lermites phenomenon is thought to be almost diagnostic or pathognomonic of uh, MS as well, but we do know that other things in the cervical cord can produce the same findings. The Dawson fingers, it's not 100%, but very commonly uh, tip you off to the diagnosis of MS. Can be seen as people get older is if, when you have vascular disease and multiple strokes, uh, sometimes the older person who has those findings on an MRI may mimic uh, MS, so you never know if they had MS before or whether it was due to the vascular disease. So there are certain things that can help tip us in that direction of knowing it's MS or not. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay, well, let's thank the doctors for being here today. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. For anybody who's leaving,